From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Bioethics Tower here in Kansas City with a great webinar today. Before I introduce Jenny Leinbarger, a few um, reminders. Uh, the application deadline for both our certificate program and our uh, full-time one-year bioethics fellowship is December 15th. So if you're interested in either the certificate program, which is mostly online, or the residential fellowship program, get those applications in. We'll be reviewing those soon. Our next webinar, Carol Taylor will be here uh, January 10th at a new time. Instead of noon central, it'll be 10, 10 o'clock central. 10 to 11, um, uh, talking about some uh, disparity issues. And um, today we uh, are going to talk about resiliency. Uh, Jenny Leinbarger is here. Dr. Leinbarger uh, got her MD at the University of Missouri. She then did residency, pediatric residency, adolescent fellowship at uh, Rochester, and then went to Harvard to do a fellowship in pediatric palliative care and came here to Children's Mercy in 2011 and has built one of the premier pediatric palliative care programs in the country. And she is going to talk to us today about living or surviving approaches to professional resiliency. One reminder, she's going to talk for about 30 minutes. If you have a question or comment, there's two ways that you could send those to us. One, the little chat room on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You could just type them in there and hit send. Or you can tweet us at hashtag CMBioethics, Children's Mercy Bioethics. And if you, uh, you can now go up to 288 characters on those, so you could really uh, get a long question in, <laughs> unlike in our prior webinars. So feel free to make a comment or ask a question. We'll get to those after about a half an hour. Take it away, Jenny. Thanks, John. <laughs> I, um... I have a lot of thoughts about this topic, um, and I have to give some credit for the title of Living or Surviving to a patient's dad. Um, as John mentioned, I work in hospice and palliative medicine, and I had met a new patient about two weeks before I gave a version of this talk for the first time, and the father, partway through our, our initial consult, said, so really really it's just we have to figure out when it changes from him living to him just surviving. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know, that applies to so much, so much. And, and so I, I co-opted it. I have hit, since had a chance to tell him I co-opted it, and he was quite excited that his uh, few phrases had, had made such an impact. So um, that's the backstory on living or surviving. Um, really just to think about today, a few objectives, really looking at some definitions. I think the media has um, a lot of different ways of intermingling each of these things, uh, compassion fatigue, burnout, resiliency, um, as well as secondary trauma. And so I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what those mean. I also... Um, want to defend the importance of addressing burnout. And, and I use that word very intentionally because I think that um, in different times that I've talked about this, there's been this sense of, oh, it's all talk and hasn't this always been a problem and why are we really considering it? And so I, I want to defend why that's important to think about. And then even suggest some interventions um, aimed to minimize burnout or enhance resiliency at that individual or even local institutional level. What I also want you to keep in mind as we do this is that I'm not an expert. There are lots of people who study professional resiliency for a living. I do not. Um, I got involved in this work because I have always been a big advocate of our learners. Um, and through uh, a work with the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the 
resident section, the fellows, asked the AAP to help create a curriculum about grief and loss. And I had the pleasure of being a part of the working group to create that curriculum. And through the process of creating that, we said, you know, we recognize that we need to have some tools for helping our trainees um, figure out how they're going to handle the grief and the loss and the tragedy that they encounter in their work. But beyond those practical pieces, there's also that bigger picture piece about how do we help them become more resilient and what does that look like? Um, and so it's from that background that I got involved in this work um, and, and came to have a passion for it. So you'll hear a little bit today about a focus on our learners, on our trainees. This will be a little bit physician centric and I apologize for that too. Um, but I think really what I have is is something that can be very practical and utilized by everybody. Um, and so I just want to start with this image. Um, some of you may remember seeing this on the web. Some of you may have your own feelings that come to mind as you look at this provider crouched outdoors in the dark. This was an emergency room physician who had just cared for a 19-year-old patient who had died. And the image was captured by a few of the EMS responders who had brought that patient in. This, this image went viral. Um, I don't know what it was about it that made it go viral. Was it that there are so many people who have felt like bowing down in sadness and despair like that? Is it that society had forgotten that sometimes doctors are emotionally impacted by the care they give? Is it recognizing that there is an element of burden to caring for patients and, and watching as, as things don't go quite the way we want them to? I think a part of this um, circles back to an article that was written in relation to this then um, about that tyranny of perfection that we have of providers um, asking for perfection that is unachievable and yet acting as if it's extremely reasonable. And because of that, people often will feel like they're falling short each day. The author of those words is, is Danielle Orphy, I say that wrong, Orphy, um, who also had written a book called What Doctors Feel. And what I'm finding is that while published four years ago, it, it hit a wave of popularity and, and some people aren't familiar with it anymore. Um, and so I want to bring it back to life a little bit, if you will. Um, and what she talked about is some of the core emotions that occur in patient encounters. Those emotions um, of uncertainty, feeling empathy, feeling grief, feeling guilt, shame, and even curiosity. And I think that these top three are each gonna be touched upon today. And so in starting with this idea of uncertainty, there's a definition that I hadn't seen before I started working on this that's that from Renee Fox, um, that that feeling of uncertainty comes from incomplete or imperfect mastery of the available knowledge. So sometimes we're uncertain because we're just starting out, we're just learning something. A second version is that Uncertainty comes from limits in the current medical knowledge, the state of the field rather than the state of the individual. And so I encounter this day to day in, in palliative care work in peds of we just don't know what makes one brain that is badly injured recover and another one not. We, we don't, we have uncertainty as a field. It's, it's not just me. And then there is a third type of uncertainty 
is the inability to differentiate the first from the second. <laughs> do I not know because I don't know and I haven't learned it yet, or do I not know because it can't be known yet? And so each of those components of uncertainty plays out at the bedside and influences how a provider feels. Sometimes inadequate is the word that comes to mind. I think another feeling that we tend to tout as being so important is the idea of empathy. What I'm going to argue is that there's, there's a flip side to being empathetic. Um, we recognize empathy as being able to recognize a patient's suffering, um, trying to appreciate why they're approaching a decision or, or an illness in the way that they are. It's often easier if, we, if it makes sense to us, if their approach is one that we could imagine ourselves having. And because of that, we, we can recognize that empathy is a cognition. It's a thought process that allows you to understand where a patient's coming from while not really feeling it yourself. And yet, we say it's about not really feeling it yourself. And it is because you're not feeling it the way the patient is or the way the patient's parent is. But that's not the same as not feeling. And so one of the articles that... Um, Ofri quoted in her book is, is was done in 2010 with a group of adult oncologists. Um, and she said, you know, these are people who day in, day out um, deal with patients for whom they need to be really empathetic. Um, and they said, you know, how, how do you handle it? And most of them said, you know, I do a pretty good job. I'm able to, to sort of box it in um, and feel like it's, it's there and I handle it and it's at work and, and it, it, it's okay. But what they actually found when they started to talk more with the providers is this sort of pervasive uh, way that it entered into every other facet of their life. Um, and the quote that, that she has about that is that grief was pervasive sticking to the physician's clothes when they went home after work and slipping under the doors between the patient rooms. And so when that came to my mind, because I like balancing something really serious and sad with a little humor, is I pictured this slipping under the doors <laughs> is that slime, like we imagined from the days of the Ghostbusters and Slimer, that he would leave that little goo behind <laughs> on everybody's clothes. But what it really comes from is from caring about the patient um, and personalizing um, that medicine that you provide at the bedside to a patient. And I think that how that starts to impact us and how we strive to compartmentalize is really summed up in this poem that I don't know the author of. This is a poem handed to me by one of our chaplains here at Children's Mercy. Um, and he had gotten it from a pediatric resident. And she wrote, he did say it was a her when he handed it to me. I don't want to call you Eric. I don't want to know your name. I prefer you as a number, one of many all the same. You can be a diagnosis, a list of tasks that I must do, but I can't think of you as Eric or my heart will ache for you. Right? And so I think that there really is a component of something that is that curse of empathy. And it comes out in a lot of different ways. It can come out as compassion fatigue, where we just don't have the capacity, the interest, the desire to be empathetic for somebody. We're overwhelmed by that feeling. It could be secondary trauma where the individual or, or I become traumatized by hearing about an event described to me. The mother who tells me about her delivery and hearing the resuscitation of her baby. That's a secondary trauma. I wasn't there. It's not my baby. But I feel that. 
And then there's moral distress, which we talk a lot about in this uh, certificate course. And, and really the definition that sticks with me for that is when you know the right thing to do. And I put that in quotes because it's typically relative, but you're prevented by, from doing it. Um, and I think that that person or force preventing you um, can be the organization, can be other providers, can be the family, can be the society. And all three of these things go back to empathy, which is a little bit different than thinking about burnout. But I would argue that each of these, if left unchecked, certainly contribute to burnout. And so if we think about the original definitions, burnout came into existence as a phrase in the 70s. Um, the leading standard assessment tool is the Maslow um, Burnout Inventory that was standardized in 1981. And really in those early works, I talked about there being three classic symptoms, feeling exhausted, feeling depersonalization, and then having a reduced sense of accomplishment. What they did with that work over time is they've, they've delved in a little further and Maslach and Leiter actually wrote about this again in 2008. And they talked about six factors um, that could even be seen as early predictors of job burnout and engagement. And those six factors come down to the workload, to a sense of control, to reward in its attendant recognition, to community or social support, to a feeling of fairness, and to our values. And there were some authors who took these six factors a step further and they actually looked at them for pediatric residents explicitly. Um, and they published it, uh, I saw it online, actually it's online ahead of print, um, in a new journal that's called Burnout Research. <laughs> it exists now. But you could sort of think about how in medicine each of these six factors might come into play for somebody. We think about that workload of long hours, the medical complexity of the patients, the volume of admissions or discharges or death. We think about that feeling of control of who gets to help make the schedule, who really has the final say over what happens to a patient. Do you have control over that or not? Um, to those pieces of reward or whether it's just expected of you rather than a recognition? Is there an adequate community of support to help get you through the day, to function as a team, to go to these bed signs? And is there a sense of fairness about how the work environment gets played out? Um, I think that often there are those behind the scenes rules um, that happen. I think recently of like the, the PHI incidences that change dramatically the workflow and does it feel fair or right or does it just get in the way? Why is it happening? Um, and then the sense of values, um, of feeling, do your values as a provider line up with the institution's values? Do they line up with the family's values in a way that makes it feel okay taking care of that patient? And so I think each of these uh, will we'll we'll be coming back to um, here in, in just a few minutes. But first to think about the misconceptions that come with burnout, the idea that it only happens once you've like given everything. And so nobody in their first year can really feel this, you know, like that's, that's just silly. Like they, they just don't know. Um, or that if they're exhausted, the best thing to do is just tough it out. I had somebody tell me the other day, we got to just power through. The idea that a day off will cure the exhaustion. I'm guilty of feeling that, of hoping for that. Um, the idea that it's only the responsibility of the individual, that, that if so-and-so is feeling that way, that's their own problem. Maybe it's, it's their own weakness. Maybe they're feeling depressed. Maybe they should just keep it secret. I don't really want to know that they're feeling that way, because darn it, I am too, and how dare they feel it more than me. It becomes a competitive. And then the other misconception is that it requires a major change. 
I don't want to deal with it because it would change too much. I must think of a different career, a different field, a different subspecialty. Maybe if I didn't do ICU medicine anymore, I wouldn't feel this way. And I think that there's a lot of people that, that wonder about that. And so I really want to suggest that there is a grief process inherent in this. And so if we think about the stages of grief, and I know they don't happen in any particular order, but just as we think about it, I think there is a piece of us that gets by denying symptoms of burnout. That's how they show up at work the next day. I think there's a group of people really angry that they're feeling burned out. And I think that's part of what gets a lot of press. I think that whole concept of the major life change is what's necessary goes into the bargaining. You know, if maybe I, I only work, you know, 80% time, that would do it. Would it? Is, is that bargaining? Um, this idea that depression exists. Um, we don't have any studies of saying, is somebody with a history of depression or prone to um, that mental health diagnosis, are they more likely to feel symptoms of burnout or not? If burnout goes unchecked, are they more likely to become depressed? I don't think we've gotten to that level of understanding it yet. Um, but certainly that idea that once you accept it, you can start to address it. And you may not have the smiley face that's in this picture and image on the screen, um, but it's a starting point. And in fact, some people would say that there's actually an ethical imperative to addressing burnout in the workforce. JAMA published on this. There's evidence that indicates that actions at an organizational and individual level can counter this national problem. It's all starting to sound very dramatic, right? An ethical imperative the national problem, but what does it really look like? Because I'm a pediatrician, I went to the literature on, on pediatrics, and there was actually a study that was just published in pediatrics uh, in 2017, looking at residents from 11 of uh, the re residency programs in New England, and about 40% of the respondents um, endorsed symptoms of burnout. And of those who endorsed burnout, um, they reported suboptimal patient care attitudes and behaviors. I don't care if they get the right meds to go home on. I don't care how their follow-up's coordinated. I don't need to be super timely in getting these test results back to them. It impacted patient care. And it led to them being less sympathetic. So why does that happen? This is a, a flow diagram that I really stole from some colleagues in the palliative care world. Um, they published an article called Building Resilience in Palliative Care Physicians. And really um, started looking at these personal resources and the work demands and how those two things go together to create this concept of workplace well-being. And then based on how they come together for you can lead to resiliency or to burnout. And so they go on to talk a little bit more about some of the specific areas and we'll do the same. But I also want to share what they had to say about this concept of burnout and resiliency. They drew a parallel to communication skills. He said, you know, before 2000, there is sort of this idea that communication was either just something you as a clinician were really good at or not so great at. And that's just how it was. And what they have discovered over time is that there are some core skill sets that can be taught, that can be practiced, that can be learned to lead to better communication. And the argument that they make is that resiliency is a similar model that we are at those early stages of saying, hey, this is a problem, but it's not just that one person happens to be more resilient than another or a better communicator than another, but really there is a set of skill sets that we should work to educate about, foster, and promote. And so 
it's best to step back for a second and think about resiliency. And some of the early work on resiliency came out of the concentration camps. They said, how did some of these people survive such conditions, such devastation? And the themes that they really came out of, out of, out of that work that Vanderpool did was he came up with this idea that the survivors all had this plastic shield about them. And that was the phrase he used. And that shield included having a sense of humor. It included an ability to form attachments with other people, to not feel alone and the possession of an inner psychological space. We've modified that a little bit in one of the um, resiliency theories out of, uh, Kudo reviewed a whole bunch of them for the Harvard Business Review in an article that, that, sh that she was writing and said, summarized that there's this staunch acceptance of reality. This is how it is, I'm here, there's a deep belief that life is meaningful. So maybe I'm here for a reason. This is the reality I'm in for a reason. And they have an uncanny ability to improvise or find a solution to a problem without proper material and tools. People have gone on and reviewed it a little further and, and through presenting this work uh, a handful of times, one of the new phrases or um, works that I had learned about is, is out of this resiliency force program. Um, and it's two guys out of Australia who have a resiliency training curriculum. And why I like this model is that it hones in a little bit on different personality styles, prior um, ways of trying to score or assess somebody's resiliency um, as well as what we've learned about how the brain modulates different pieces of this. And so really the six domains that they focus on are, are having a sense of purpose and goals, being able to regulate emotions, figure out where you have biases, be able to problem solve, anticipate, plan, maintaining your own health. Did you eat today? Did you sleep today? Have you exercised this week? thinking about persistency and an ability to back, bounce back, and thinking about who those support networks are that help do that. And so they have worked on finding ways to measure each of these things so that just like we eventually developed a, an inventory for burnout symptoms, the idea is that they hope to create this predictive model. Um, we don't need to go too much into that. I'm not about setting up a research project, but I think these components uh, make sense. And so going back to this idea of how you come out with resiliency, the authors of the same paper that had that flow talked about the individual skills really being, can you work from your strengths? Do you know what activates you in both positive and negative ways? Have you figured out how to establish some healthy boundaries? regulate your emotions, recognize your distortions, set some reasonable expectations, find meaning, and commit to the long term. Those individual skills sound a lot like those six domains from a few slides back. And the workplace factors they identified go back really nicely to those six factors that, that Maslach and, and Leiter really identified of do you have control is there a structured system for rewards? Have you built a community, promoted fairness, recognized the values of the people working together, and calibrated that workload? And so what this looks like can be really different from one day to the next, from one team to the next, but it really does offer us a framework from which to really think about our own skill set our own institution and how we can reduce that feeling of burnout and promote resiliency. And so this is hard to do in a webinar, but I want everybody to pause for a minute and think about the skills that they use. In the moment of a stress, a trigger, a patient encounter, a nasty email, whatever it is, 
What do you do after that event? Does it spiral into one? And then what do you do long term? And these three questions seem really simple. But sometimes it is the most simple things that we forget. Um, and so in working with trainees, colleagues, reminding them that they have some of these skills is a profound way to start to reduce burnout and enhance resiliency. There are a few other ways too. I think we have a lot of reframing to do, which is a phrase I stole from my goal setting and advanced care planning world. I think that we need to figure out how to address resiliency for our trainees. And I think that a lot of people higher up than me have started to recognize that. Um, and both the American College of Graduate Medical Education and the American Board of Pediatrics have put out milestones as part of the training curriculum. And several of them tie back to this concept of um, individual wellness or resiliency. And so I say, don't look any further than those milestones. It's there, you have an excuse to create something. It's not just because you're going all touchy-feely on somebody. I think we need to think about addressing resiliency in faculty development. I think I need more than creating an e-portfolio or gaining some writing skills, not to dismiss Martha's work. <laughs> I, think, I think we need more. And I think this ties in perfectly into what we think of as faculty mm -hmm. development. And I think that it's clear that this idea of self-calibration is a component of professionalism and has a place. And I think addressing resiliency fits into an organization's mission. We have seen that reducing burnout or enhancing resiliency improves collegiality, improves retention, reduces medical errors, and improves patient satisfaction. The data for this is there. We haven't had a big enough ground swelling, especially at some institutions. I gave a version of this talk to a, a private for-profit hospital. And they said, you know, our hospital's culture is to hire straight out of training, knowing that they won't want to stay in this job forever. And it's even cheaper to hire them, use them, and let them go. And they said to me, Jenny, I can't take these things to them necessarily. The retention argument won't work at my institution. Well, OK, let's find the other ones that will um, and go from there. And so how? I think that we've recognized here that, that having a system for debriefing makes a difference. There are institutions who have different facilitated peer support sessions available. Um, Doctoring to Heal came out of UCSF. Um, even online, you can download programmatic guides to how to hold these monthly sessions addressing um, your sense of professionalism. Um, balance groups are what I experienced in my own fellowship training, and that's more of a psychoanalysis meets case discussion. Um, and, and does require a formal, uh, formally trained facilitator. Um, and then there's the Finding Meaning in Medicine programs um, that really grew out of the work of Rachel Naomi Raymond um, and started actually at the, at the med student level, um, but have trickled into to other venues. I think that there is an opportunity to offer workshops for skills training. Um, I'll give you a slide that helps you connect to the grief and loss curriculum that sort of started my entry point into all of this. Um, I think the conflict resolution training our own ethics committee here did offers pointers in how to do some of this. And I think mindfulness programs have a role 
um, and really benefiting some people. What studies have found out of interventions is that the most positive impact comes from multiple exposures, not a one and done, um, not only this type of a, an intervention, but a, a multitude. Um, and to do this in the workplace um, and have leaders of the institution or of the training program involved um, to, to recognize and put some additional oomph into that, that importance of it all. And so since I mentioned, started mentioning the, the curriculum and, and brought it up again here, it is available for anybody on the American Academy of Pediatrics website through the section on hospice and palliative medicine. Um, really looked at four parts. One, just a, an understanding of grief um, and that experience for children and their families. An entire section on communication skills, particularly um, when it's about a patient, um, a pediatric patient with a terminal illness. A whole section on managing emotions after a challenging case, which is part of where I stole that in the moment after the event long term from. Um, of, and also offers some ways for, for residents to start their own debriefing program. And then segued into an introduction for personal wellness. Um, and this can even get at that professionalism level of here is a tool, a learning plan for myself that's a wellness plan, not just a, I want to tackle these, these components um, of, of clinical work or research work, but really including um, a more personal side to it. And so on that, um, I've offered references. I promised I didn't totally steal the images. <laughs> the one of the little girl in Namaste is my niece, so she's not up there and you can't have her. <laughs> and I'm open to any thoughts or questions. Well, thank you. For people online, if you have thoughts or questions, type them into that little chat box on the lower right-hand corner of your screen or tweet them to us at hashtag CMBioethics and we will read them out. Uh, 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 Jenny will answer. Let me start with one, though. Um, so you direct a pediatric palliative care program. Mm -hmm. You have a bunch of people working with you, taking care of these critically ill and sometimes dying children. What sort of, uh, which of these have you put into place? How, how have you helped your team deal with this? Um, I think that's a, a great, right? A, practicing what you preach can be hard sometimes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that that we um, have really focused on is um, trying to have some flexibility. And so one of the first things that came to my mind is when we were trying to hire some additional nursing staff and um, the, the institutional level concept was that we really needed somebody who would work five days a week and the nurses already doing the work said that that's not sustainable. Mm. Um, institution didn't quite buy it. We hired people who were required to work five days a week and we had turnover. And it became clear that, that there is that component mm. um, to recognizing what is reasonable to do in a week for patient care. So I think that's one thing is being open to that. Um, another thing that we do regularly is um, we call them self-care sessions. They happen twice a month. It is really a chance to sit down and we have a reflection led by one of our chaplains at the institution. And so in many ways that may be its own equivalent of doctoring, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to heal. Um, because often it'll start with a reading or a story that would then trigger us to reflect on how to incorporate that or how it resonates with us. So, so they don't start with a particular case usually? No, starts, no, no, it starts more. And, and that is very much in line with the, um, 
both the finding meaning in medicine and the doctoring to heal are, are mo much more driven by a story, a poem, uh, from what I've understood through learning about them. Mm -hmm. And that's more the model that we've used. Mm -hmm. Twice a month. Mm -hmm. so. Is it enough? Don't know. Well, the other phrase you used was honest and regular self-calibration. Yeah, right? <laughs> Uh, how good do you think we are at self-calibrating? I, mean, I think it's a very individual thing. Yeah. Um, I think with time, some people can become more in tune to when they're off. Mm -hmm. um, I find if I start to um, want to yell at other drivers on the road, mm -hmm. I'm probably starting off with a bad day. Um, that's sort of one of my things of like, okay, if I'm that snappy in this thing that really doesn't matter, I should be aware going mm -hmm. into the day. We've done a really cheesy thing with our team yeah. um, that I'm kind of proud of too. And so each day we actually recognize whether I'm feeling more like a sun or more like a cloud. And I am sure there are people who will scoff at this idea. Um, but just taking a moment to recognize a name. Am I coming in today with a more sunny disposition mm -hmm. or a cloudier disposition? And is that building up over time? Um, and how can we support one another on those days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the supporting each other is important. One of the things you didn't mention when you showed the first picture of the uh, ER doc was mm -hmm. um, how alone she was. Yeah. Um, I probably didn't because I think that everybody processes their own grief and emotions a little differently. Mm -hmm. And I much rather be by myself if I'm crying mm -hmm. than surrounded by people. And perhaps it's the same. And so that didn't trigger to my head. Loneliness, but more a need for mm -hmm. aloneness. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But I think, I think different people read into that differently. Are there places that you're aware of that have done this right or done it better than others? <laughs> so, and um, how would we know? Well, we're working on it. Um, I actually pulled up a slide <clears throat> from the PEED side. Um, I know that there, there are some groups working on figuring out, are there some interventions that work better than others mm -hmm. at a training program level? Mm -hmm. Um, we are not a part of this program, so I'm, I'm not breaking any conflict of interest, but there, there is a, a program that initially started off with 40 pediatric residency programs, um, just looking at what are factors in burnout and resilience. And then they went a little further to try to uh, find um, commonalities in how those burnout and resilient um, residents did with patient care in, in, in situations. And then um, what my understanding is, is they're moving into a phase of looking at wellness interventions and longitudinal follow-up. Mm -hmm. So it's still early, like I talked about with that communication analogy. Mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure of getting to talk with Vicki Jackson, um, who helps run the palliative care program in Boston. And she was one of the authors on that paper that looked at the individual factors and the workplace factors. And um, when, we, when we had her speak most recently in October, actually in September, um, AAP changed when it was hosted this year. <laughs> she um, talked about and shared some of the things that, that their team has done since her work um, in this began. And she said, you know, we started off requiring mindfulness training. And we found really early on that that wasn't a fit for everybody. It had a lot of good. It could be one of the tools in the toolbox, but it wasn't a, a universal fit. Um, and so they actually now have it built in that if you're hired new to their team, you do sessions just like is totally common and standard within social work where you have a preceptor 
-hmm. and you bring them your challenging cases, your trying events, and it's it's this individual work. And you they do it for palliative care or for all the residents. Well, so this is this is um, my understanding of the palliative care team at Mass General. Okay. Um, each new hire faculty. Mm -hmm. They, I think she described that they did it first um, with everybody, right? So they started somewhere and then now all the new hires go through it on their own. And then at the three year of faculty, um, you start doing it less frequently and as a group. Okay. Um, but to build in this very intentional, what are the things that drive me to feel secondary trauma? What are the things that drive me to moral distress? And really addressing those at the individual level. Sounds like a great program. I know. Um, this one's pretty new. Go ahead, Angie. I just want to, hopefully this is working. Okay, great. Um, nursing has um, long delved into this and actually mm -hmm. was a new grad in 81. As all the research was being done, my organization actually had courses for new grad nurses because as you're coming in, you don't know what to expect and actually work through some of Patricia Benner's work, not as mm -hmm. an expert, but burnout was a piece of that and knowing to have how to find support. Um, also recognizing those symptoms as you're learning, because you're learning so many tasks, you're learning how to get along with others and all of that. So that work's kind of been a balance and I don't want to brag, but I think nursing has tackled this before medicine has and hopefully they can, we can use some of that. Here at Children's Mercy, that's what nursing ethics forum practices. Um, part of ours is not just learning ethics, but it's learning to support others and provide that education and self-care education to help work through things as they do just our retreat last week we started out the first one hour as jenny knows she's come before is that it's self-care and we had not only an exercise that we worked with each other to talk about how to deal with our own mental self-care but then we brought robin neal from the wellness program to do self-care so i think you have to practice both self-care reflection and peer support to help work through all of these things that burn that can lead to burnout and do you have a sense of how well it's working or how we compare to other places? Um, I don't know about comparing to other places, although lots of folks have asked us about our nursing ethics forum. I know after the retreat, I've received three emails thanking for those staff that have not only did we in talking ethics that impact what they're dealing with, but also the retreat and self-support I mean, support and self-care that was provided felt gave them energy to go on for the next steps when they get back to the unit. It's interesting to look at the connection between this sort of work and what we do in ethics mm -hmm. because, I mean, I think the piece that ethics tends to address is the moral distress piece. Mm -hmm. And at least in some cases, what we find is sort of the opportunity to express those feelings of moral distress in a safe space relieve Leaves some of them to some resolution yeah sometimes i mean sometimes it you know highlights that the problem is with the system but sometimes it just allows people to better understand what's behind mm -hmm. uh, whatever events or facts are causing causing the distress go ahead brian and for people online let me remind you if you have a question or comment just type it in there we'll read those out Jenny, that was a, a great presentation, and thank you for your efforts in this regard. In, in, in my own reflection on this, uh, to get to some of the questions John's answering, uh, excuse me, asking, I, I think if you look at the hospice and palliative care movement, and in particular the hospice industry, uh, modeling self-care and regular engagement in this reflective practice uh, is normative there. And it's now being sort of integrated into other aspects of healthcare. Um, if one were to go back 20 or 30 years ago, you wouldn't find much about resiliency and self care except for there and in nursing, as, as Angie mentioned. Perhaps one of our obstacles as physicians is that we tend to be too autonomous, uh, inclined to believe that we should be self sufficient. And that makes me go back to an early slide or comments that you had about managing expectations and issues of control. Uh, I noted an absence on some of the observed 
emotions was the uh, absence of feeling sad. Sadness is a separate emotion from those that were placed up on the slide and dealing with the tragic realities that we do in critical care medicine and throughout children's hospitals, I think uh, evokes uh, a response in which we are either going to be accepting or reframing or we're going to feel over, overly burdened. So I, I wonder if acknowledgement of that might move us towards something that comes from more of the spiritual domain, and that is the mystery of life and all that we deal with. And accepting that we don't know everything or why and its ultimate meaning, I think, sometimes might equip us with a sense of resiliency or an ability to respond to the sad and the tragic that make up our day-to-day -day business. We've got a few um, <clears throat> comments coming in uh, online and we'd love to see a few more. Um, one of them is not really a question, it's someone kind of sharing their experience and I guess you could comment on it. Uh, it's uh, someone from Sick Kids in Toronto they, they note that they offer their teams, uh, their interdisciplinary teams, pre-briefs, debriefs, and voicing spaces, places to talk about the hard stuff. Uh, they're looking at how to evaluate, but their informal feedback is that it's a, it seems like a safe uh, place to talk about challenges in the clinical, in clinical care with other team members. Uh, their focus is on supporting people to reflect and help them to be open to thinking outside their own box. They've been holding them weekly, but may uh, have anywhere from two to ten people attending. So that's one that of their experience. That sounds really cool and exciting. Yeah. Um, someone else uh, wants to get your opinion on how effective it would be to um, have uh, introduction and, ref and reform resilience workshops to train residents right from year one level. So I, I think... I think there are some institutions looking at doing that, um, and that's a, a part of what this uh, resiliency consortium was wanting to work on. Um, I think it's it's interesting here. One of the things that we do is for residents when they're on their required development and behavioral rotation, they spend two afternoons with our team, but it's not going out and doing patient care. Um, it's about sitting down and talking about how they're feeling, managing their own behaviors in development as a physician, um, and and what is is particularly challenging. Um, and one of our nurses leads that session, um, and many of the residents talk about how helpful that is um, to have this sort of unexpected space. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be great to come up with some more formalized ways. We also, at the beginning of second year, um, as part of the different trainings to become a senior resident, we've incorporated a session um, where there is a, a parent panel um, and four parents talk about their experience as bereaved parents. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, we talk again about what what is the role of the physician at those bedsides um, either leading up to the death or after the death and how does that make us us feel um, and really working through those emotions so i think being really um, aware that this need exists for residents um, and making it a part of the day one talk is is not going to throw anybody off. I think that the majority of residents that, that we hear from want this recognized, mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm a person too. Mm -hmm. uh, question, of, uh, question of my own that kind of arises from some comments that John made on our weekly discussion this week in the, in the certificate course, which is, he, he kind of noted, observe that, um, you know, both ethics and palliative care share a kind of common feature where they are not, a, they're sort of almost framed as something independent of the rest of medicine. Like they're these little specialized 
uh, silos that are kind of off on their own by the, w- the way we talk about them as if um, we're going to talk about palliative care today as if that's not shouldn't be integrated with all of medicine from the start or ethics as if that's some separate domain right. <laughs> that's that doesn't run through every part of, of medicine. And so as an expert in both palliative care and ethics, I'm kind of wondering how you you see that as potentially part of the problem or part of the potential solution here to to better integrate uh, understanding of palliative care and ethics, um, not as a separate thing that, and, and I, I, I'll relate it to like the medical students I teach that aren't in a bioethics program, they tend to see ethics as some kind of like diversion or some kind of interruption of the real medical training. It's like, oh, we have to have our ethics, you know, our ethics lecture <laughs> this week or whatever. And it's sort of like it's framed almost in the very way it's presented to them as if it's like this independent thing. And I just feel like the programs that are really doing a good job of integrating ethics education throughout a medical curriculum are the ones that are really starting to see, uh, I don't know, more buy-in and, and better facility with Know, ethical concepts among the, the trainees and I have a friend who teaches at uh, Beaumont in, in up around Detroit and and that's the, pro- the approach they're taking there and they're having great results with because they're it's totally integrated into the program they have recursion they come back to points and uh, it's a really interesting model and it seems to kind of maybe do a better job of, of handling some of this so I'm just wondering if you have thought of things like that in terms of both the training and the actual practice. Um, I think both are, are absolutely a, a common thread more than a, a silo, or, mm-hmm. or ideally would be. And I, I think that, at least in my time here, I have watched some of that integration happen. Mm-hmm. Um, the the phrasing we use in in hospice and palliative medicine is is this idea of primary palliative care mm-hmm. that every clinician should have a set of these skills. For, for having conversations about goals and values and um, that shouldn't only be the purview of somebody board certified in palliative care. And, and I, think, I think people are wanting more. Um, I, I think that palliative care teams and their consults, um, you know, the the number that we're getting of this is just a really sad situation or this is just a really challenging family. Mm-hmm. Can, can, would you guys, you know, like come to a consult? And it's like, well, that's not really the role. Like, let's, let's work on your skill set mm-hmm. um, to help you, resident A and fellow B, you know, really figure out how you can do this um, with us behind the scenes because, no, we don't really need to meet this patient. Um, and, and I think that that happens with ethics phone calls too. Mm-hmm. Like think about the number that are phone calls that don't then turn into a formal consult process. So there, there is something there. I, I haven't fully worked out what it is or, or how to think about it, but, um, I do think that we've arrived at a stage for palliative care and for ethics where, where this idea of there's a skill set that should be held by every pediatrician. Right. Um, exists. It does get to this idea of self-calibration too. I mean, to a certain extent, this is something every clinician should learn as part Mm of becoming a skilled clinician, becoming a professional. I mean, you need to monitor yourself because if you're yelling at drivers on the way in, you're probably also going to be you know, that you're in Boston, it did it to me. <laughs> lose, lose, losing empathy or making medical errors, and you won't be a good clinician. But then there's also, uh, if you take the balance group as the other extreme, there's the sort of stuff you get into if you have a trained psychoanalyst meeting with you mm-hmm. weekly or, or twice a month that is a different level of yeah. exploration, something you wouldn't be expected to be able to do on your own. So, I mean, part of it, whether in palliative care, ethics, or resiliency, is sort of what's the level you should be able to do yourself versus when do you need that expert help. Yeah. 
And that might be a good note to stop unless we have another comment online. So, Jenny, thank you very much. This was great. I hope people online uh, got something out of this. It was great to hear from other programs and what people are doing in other places. We are done for this calendar year with our webinars, but we'll be back on January 10th with Carol Taylor. And we have a great lineup for the spring. So we'll see you all in 2018.